Hi, this is Bruce Kirchhoff, and we're going to take a look at how we could add your own images to visual learning plan identification. So this is the program running. Let's going to, we're going to switch now right over to a window that shows the install directory. So this is when you unzip the files, you will see these different um, files and directories. I'll run through what's in each of these directories. I'm going to assume that you know um, basically how the program operates, that you've read through the tutorial or help files, or you've worked through some videos that we have on YouTube that show how the program operates. We'll just go through them straight down. Here's the database. It has only one file in it. It's a CSV file, and this is the file we're going to be editing in order to add your own images. So this has got the information about all of the images in the program. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. The grades directory is where we find it's an output directory when you're running a script. The um, files that are output from running that script are put here. So here's the sample one that comes with the program and it's explained in the help file how this output file works. In the help yeah, in the help files. Here's some graphics. This just has the graphics for the main screen, the splash screen, those kinds of things. There's some welcome text that's displayed. This is the name of the program. Uh, um, you really never, pretty much never need to look at this unless you were doing a really major customization and you wanted to change the full look of the program. This video does not go in how to, how to do that. It is possible and it's actually quite easy, but this video does not go into it. The help files, this is where the information on the help file and the tutorial file are. You can always access them from here, but they can also be accessed from within the program by pressing F1 or by going under the help menu and selecting help files or tutorial. And you should again have read these by the time you're looking at this. If you haven't, you probably should take time to stop this video and read these so you understand how VLPI works. Images. This is where you're going to add your images. This has all of the images in it already. You can see down here it has over 8,000 images to start with. These are mainly from the southeastern United States, although you see it's got some general plants like this Silotum in it. It's got a few California plants, etc., but mainly it's from the southeastern United States. So you're going to add your images here. <clears throat> the images that I've got in the program are either numbered or they have a letter in front of them with a number after it. Now you can follow that convention if you want but you can also name the file any way you want. The program will work with any kind of name you want on, on it. There can be spaces in the name, no special characters of course, as long as they're valid names. Even relatively long val valid names are fine for this. The only trick is that you have to have the same name on the image and in that database file. So the database file is going to link to these names. Name of the image here and the name of the database file have to be the same. We'll come back to that. The library is just some, we're not going to look in there, it's some Java um, programs that come with the, it, they're nothing that we made, there are some libraries for the Java. For Java. Save taxa sets. There's nothing in here right now because we haven't saved any taxa sets. You can save them from within the program. And again, I refer you to the help files to learn how this works. Nothing you're going to customize the program. There is nothing you need to do with this directory. Scripts are explained in the tutorial and the help files. They are essentially little macros. You can create them with a subsidiary program. Again, that's not covered in this video, but you can learn about how to use them in the help and tutorial files and there is another video that explains how to create them. User files, this is where your usernames are, are um, stored. For me now there's just one user of the program, me, but if there were multiple users, say it was on a lab computer or something, they could all have their own usernames and it would all be stored here and it would track their use independently based on their login. So you can have multiple users of the program. Licenses and Notice Docs text. The program is um, owned by Aperio 
and they license your use of it under very lenient terms. Let's just open one of them. License.txt just has the Apache license, which is the license for the software, and it is straight copyright out of what the um, Apache license is. You shouldn't touch anything in this file, but it needs to be distributed <clears throat> if you're going to create your own version and distribute it to students, or even you can distribute to anyone on the internet. That file has to be there in this place. Notice.txt. This is another required file. This file has to be here, and this has the licenses for the images. Let's look at that. The first part of this text is standard. You don't touch anything that's in that first part of the text. Under Acknowledgements, this is where you put the licenses for your images. And so here we have the licenses for all of the images, and they're in a form that you could open them in Excel if you cut and paste them into Excel. The ID number, that's the name of the image, then the license, and then who owns that license, copyright. And if we go down, we see that there are other photographers credited here for other images. Now, if you're going to license them under a Creative Commons license, I, that's what this is, Creative Commons. Um, BYNC means non-commercial and you have to um, credit the photographer, but you can use the license image in any way that you want. Given that, if you're going to use one of these Creative Commons licenses, my understanding, I'm not a lawyer, I've been told by people who are not lawyers also, that you have to have the images on the internet someplace and the license has to be specified on the internet and associated with that image in order to have the license placed in here also. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know if that's true. I took their advice though and I did it that way. If you're going to restrict use completely outside of the, this program, I do not believe you have to have your images on the internet. You just say you can use them only in this program. That's it. You can't do anything else with them. And that's kind of what I recommend you do unless you have them already. I'm not going to save this. So you're going to edit that notice.txt when you add your own images, and you're going to tell the people what the license is on your images. Okay, let's look at the database. We're going to go to the database. We're going to open the database in Excel. Just double-clicking on it opens in Excel. Now it's a CSV file, so the width of the columns does not get saved. I'm going to enlarge those a little bit so we can see what's in them. And then we'll look a little more detail at what's here. So the first row, which you're now able to read, is never changed. That has to stay just like it is, except <clears throat> for a certain part of that row, which I'll explain in a minute. Let's look at the ones that are really absolutely can never change. These ones here, I'm going to highlight them in yellow. Those parts can never change. They have to be in that order. They have to have those names. Over here, here's the second set of ones, also in yellow. They cannot change. It has to be common name 2, common name 3, common name 4, in that order, and those, those headings have to be there. The ones that can change are these. I'll highlight them in green. These can be modified, and I'll explain why and what they do in just a minute. Of the green row, um, the green columns, there can be any number as long as it is one or more. That is, you can have one green column, you can have 10 green columns. Uh, we've tried up to about 10. I suppose you could have 20. There's no reason why you couldn't have 20 or 30. You'd have a hard time finding the data for those, but um, these are attributes of the images. Okay, let's go back to the first yellow column, the ID number. This is the name of the image. It's the name of the image without JPEG on it. If you put the name of the image in here and it's got JPEG on it, the program's going to bomb when it comes to that image. It's going to tell you it can't find it because it's going to read this as the name of the image, ID number, or the ID, and it's going to stick a JPEG on it. So it's going to look for, for this red maple picture, it's going to look for an image called one.jpg. If this file here, if this column here, said one.jpg in it, the program would look for an image called one.jpg.jpg. There'd be two .jpgs there, and that would bomb. So this is just the name of the image. Take the JPEG off. 
Again, we've used numbers here, or way at the bottom we've used a letter followed by a number. You can make it anything you want. You could call this redmaple1.jpg, etc. This could be okra1.jpg, okra2.jpg, whatever you would like the name to be. That would be the name here. No JPEG, of course. Next is the common name. We've standardized our common names to whatever the common name was that was used on the um, usdaplants.org website. And I suggest you continue that practice just to be consistent. So whatever they called it, we called it here. Next, there's the genus and the species name, or the genus really in the specific epithet, but we've just called it species here. No one really sees that. So you have to <clears throat> follow that here and put the species name here. Notice that there are multiple images that are okra, and then that genus and species, and also the family name. And they're distinguished because they have different image numbers. That's how they're told apart. Family name is pretty self-explanatory. Now we come, well, let's jump over to the yellow columns, and now we have alternative common names. There can be blanks over here. Everything else we've talked about now has to have, be populated, but starting with common names, we can have blanks in them. We can even have blanks in common name too. And this is just to give us the option of adding additional common names that may not be the common name that is used by the USDA. So someone may know this plant under swap maple or scarlet maple or soft maple. These alternative common names are used only in the search function. So if you don't know what the search function is, go into the help file and look at what the search function is and play with it a little bit. And you can search for some of these things. You cannot learn the plants by these names, but you can search for them by these names. When you learn a common name in the software, it's always going to be by this common name, the USDA common name. You can search for it by these names, but not learn it by these names. Okay, so these columns can be blank, but if there is a common, at least one other common name, we suggest you put in at least one other alternative common name for the plant. Green columns. The green columns show up in a special place in the program. Let's switch to the program and we'll look at that. So I've got the program running already and let's look at group selection. And if we look at the columns in group selection, they're morphology, genus, and family. And so we can select by morphology, genus, and family here. Now let's stop that and we're going to switch back to Excel, and let's play with this. Let's change this name to, I'm just changing it to my my personal name. I'm going to save this again. I think I saved it. I'm going to go back here. It reread it. Look at that. It reread that file, and it changed the name up there to Bruce K. So, of course, that's pretty meaningless. Let's change it back. I'm going to call it Family 2 this time. I'm going to save it again. Okay, there's a trick here. So the family and the genus columns here are exactly the same as the family and the genus columns in yellow. By using them here, we give us an alternative way to select family and genus. Well, let's look at how family and genus is normally selected in the program. Let's flip back to the program, and that is under the taxa selection memo. So now we are look, reading those first yellow columns, family, genus, or species. Let's take this, say we want to select by species. We're not going to learn by common names. We're going to learn by the scientific name. And now we can select the family, the genus, and the species. This is all yellow column stuff. And you see it's kind of awkward to add them here. And so we have the alternative way of doing the same thing. We can go in here. We can say agavaceae. It res again restricts us to the genera. And now we can select by the genus. If we want to learn it at the species level, we come down here, select by species, scientific name. And we would have done just exactly the same thing as we did before. Let me just select agave and yucca, or just agave here. 
I'm going to jump to study plants and just show you that agave was selected. I'm jumping out of that. I pressed escape. I'm jumping out back to the main screen because we want to go back to the database. So you have to have one column here. It can be anything that you want. It can be any attribute of red maple that you would like to highlight. We have highlighted for all of our taxa morphology. And then I've copied genus and family here. I suggest that you continue with morphology and for each picture just show what kind of thing that you have there. If you want to know what we mean by branch with flowers, flower, sporangia, those kinds of things, again switch to the program, go into group selection, select branch with flowers. There are 76 images there, let's just select genus. I'm going to go to study plants and now we're just going to use the arrow key and we can see what branch with flowers looks like for us. It's kind of a distant view of an inflorescence, basically. I'm going to jump out of this, press escape, exit, back to Excel. So I suggest you continue that. You can delete these two files, these two columns. Let me just do that. Oops, sorry, I wanted to delete them. Save it. Go back into group selection. Now there is one column there, only one. And we could select by that morphology if we wanted to. I'm going to jump back into the Excel file. Let me see if it'll get me out of there. There, good, it did. I'm going to save it again so we're back to where we started from. Okay, there's a trick. If you're going to have family, the name family in here, it cannot be the name that is exactly the same as here, family. This has a, it's a bug in the program, kind of. Basically, what the program does in order to set that group selection box, it goes and it looks for this column called family. And then it looks for this column called common name 2. Remember, I said you couldn't change those. And then it puts whatever columns are in between those two into the group selection box. So you can see the program gets very confused if you have family and then you have family again. So over here you've just got to call it family something, family underscore, family two, family one, family anything except the exact word family. And you're all set with that and the program will work fine. A little bug we did not fix at the last minute. Okay, so you want to add a new taxon. You can do it right at the top. We can just add some more columns here. They turned out yellow because I had the top one yellow. Let me get rid of that coloring. It's not going to save. The coloring is not going to save because we're saving it as a CSV file. We have the name of the image, whatever that name is. We have the common name of the plant. the genus name, etc. And you would go on and fill the rest of those out. And then your file name would be called laakjk.jpg. Let's take a look at one more thing before we finish this presentation. I'm going to show you a feature that exists in the program but isn't currently implemented in this database. It's pretty cool. Let's First of all, start by finding a specific image. It's going to be image 1314. And if we look at that image, first we look in the column for morphology and we say, see it shows a leaf margin. Now we're going to switch over to look at that image. Here it is. And it does show a leaf margin, but it also shows the back of a leaf and a little bit of a front of a leaf. So 1314 is like that, and here's 1312, shows the front of the leaf and a little bit of the back of the leaf. Is there a way that we could label this image, both of these images, as having two features, not just one? And it turns out there is. Let's get back to our database. 
and we're going to edit this in, this line and we're going to put a semicolon at the front and then after leaf margin and put another semicolon and type the other labels that we want for that image and we'll just say leaf front semicolon and leaf back semicolon hit return to accept that I'm going to copy that and I'm going to go here for 312. I'm going to say the same thing. I just saved the database. And now I'm going to switch back to the program. Go into group selection. And now if we go down here and we look at leaf back is now there as is leaf front. But if we switch leaf back, we only get two images. If you remember, that was Asclepius, select by genus. And now we go to study plans just to see what we've got. And we see we have selected our two images. So we'll get those two images in several ways now. We can get those Im same images by selecting leaf back or leaf front. But of course, it's the same two images now. Or we could also get it by selecting leaf margin. But you see, that's going to give us a whole other, lot of other images that are also labeled with leaf margin. So this can be done with any of the cells that end up in the group selection box. We can put semicolon at the front, semicolon at the end, and a list of features that label that specific image. You might think of other ways to use this besides labeling the morphology, but at least we can do that. Well, there's other things that the program will do and other cool ways to use the database, but for now we'll stop at this point